caused me as I was looking through your notes and where this discussion might be going to get into my uh, like 80s Christian comic book collection at the top of the heap being Chuck Colson's. Born again. Yeah. Born again. <laughs> Born again. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, this is like terminology that is rolling around all these people who've lived yeah. this life's crime. But the one that I found that reminded me the most of what you've so- said so far is this one, the live it up. See, they've even got the car that you prayed on top of. Right. And it's the story of this right. guy who's off doing all these things, the sex and drugs and the rock and roll, all these this whole life, and then he becomes a Christian, and none of his friends understand, and none of his family understand. Hello and welcome to another 16-ton episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. We are with the Coming Home Network, a group of people who, for some reason or another, ended up in the Catholic Church, even though we all came from different backgrounds. Ken was a Baptist pastor. I was from a Wesleyan world. We've been talking uh, for the last episode, and we'll continue to talk for the next several episodes about how in the world Kenny Burchard, who at one point was a Pentecostal pastor, how he ended up in the Catholic Church. You can find more episodes and more resources uh, at chnetwork.org. You can also join our online community full of people who are walking through these questions together. That is community.chnetwork.org. And of course, all these resources are made free to you because of some generous people, our partners in mission. And if you want to join them in the effort, go to chnetwork.org slash donate. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing great. Good to see you. And I'm looking forward to this. I understand last Mm -hmm. week in the first episode that Kenny did, he covered 17 years of his life. And today he's (laughs) going to cover 17, the next 17 minutes. Is that correct? (laughs) No. Uh, It'll it'll feel like that. (laughs) Not exactly. We're going to cover one year. (laughs) One year. (laughs) Kenny's going to sum up his episode. So I was one (laughs) more day older and deeper in debt. That's all you could say. But uh, so let's just dive right in. Uh, we left yeah. off with you praying that prayer, and we can recap a little bit of that. And uh, you know how you got into this whole born again world. I remember you saying in the last episode that your dad sort of spat out the word "born again" when he heard about people who were of mm-hmm. a certain persuasion. So I think that's an interesting backdrop. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. your own religious background for where things are going to go today. So where do we pick up? Yeah, that's a good place to pick up. You know, I, when when last we left young Kenny, <laughs> he was praying on the hood of his car in Salt Lake City. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I now I look back and I have language for all this that is um, that's Protestant evangelical language. But I, I but now I also have a Catholic understanding of, of what that language meant and maybe over the weeks we'll unpack it a little bit but what I what I did there you know when I was on on the hood of my car in very um, evangelical terms is I accepted Jesus I you could say uh, very common language I invited Christ into my life I invited Jesus into my heart you know these are phrases that would be very common among evangelical Protestants they would be used. Uh, in church services to try to get people to become Christians. <clears throat> and the way that's done, uh, you might remember when I was talking to David, the YWAM missionary on the street, he asked me if I, quote, wanted to pray. And when I went to Rick, my karate teacher's house, and told him that I must be born again, he said, would you like to do that now? Would you? And, and he said, would you like to pray? So in both cases, it was praying. Praying is what what I understood made you a Christian. And and I think to to a large degree, you know, when you're calling on the Lord and you're opening your, your heart to the Lord, um, you are definitely moving into a relationship with the Lord at that point. Uh, of course, that language is used among um, Protestant evangelicals. I used it all the time to say, that's when I became a Christian. And I think it is when I became a Christian uh, but I, but I now I look at that phrase "born again" also through Catholic eyes, and I would say when I was born again, 
is what happens to me a year later, which I'll describe in this episode. But I definitely gave my life to Jesus Christ as much as I knew how to do it at the time. Um, and everybody I knew and trusted said, "That's you, you pray, you accept Jesus into your life. So that's what I did. I'm sitting on the hood of my car, accept Jesus into my life. I had, you know, in Catholic terminology, I had what we would call a conversion, a conversion experience. I turned to the Lord, and I believe the Lord honors that when a person does that. He answers those prayers. He Grace comes into the life of a person. And I really felt it. I mean, I felt God's grace. I ex <coughs> began experiencing God's grace in whole new ways in my in my life. And so I drove out of there. I drove away from um, from Rick's house as a uh, I had just turned 17 in June, the month before. I drove away from his house as a 17 year old young man and I went home. I drove my home at the time was about five miles away from there. I drove home and the whole time I was so excited about what was happening to me, like I had crossed a line and I had, you know, like the old song says, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. <clears throat> That's what happened to me in that moment. And right there, you can, you can kind of feel like, oh, that's so neat. How wonderful that you, you know, you started this whole new life. Was it awesome? You know, from there forward, did it, did you, you've accepted the Lord now? Is it, was it just heaven on earth from, from there on out? <laughs> uh, my response to that is no. What happened next was all hell broke loose in my life. <laughs> all hell broke loose, like, like for real. Um, the next year of my life was really, really hard for lots of different reasons. I went home. It was late. Uh, everyone's in bed. I get up and I tell my family the next day, um, I am a born again Christian now. That's what I am. Because they had watched me go through this whole process of going to the temple getting witnessed to, you know, by this missionary, having a girlfriend who's asking me to read books, having Christians in my life who are asking me to read the Bible, watching me sort through it all. So I come home and I tell my family, I announce to them, I am a born again Christian, as I understood what that meant. I have accepted Jesus. I've prayed and, and invited Jesus to be Lord of my life. Well, they weren't happy about my using that terminology. I think largely because at the time, you know, <laughs> from their perspective, the born again Christians were the crazy ones. You know, they, <laughs> they were the people that were most on fire, you know, most um, sold out to their faith. I, maybe I'll just pause right there and get your kind of your sense of that, that guys, that language and and that differentiation among uh, types of Christians. Uh, well, I have a, a few different things that I think help <laughs> elucidate this that are from a similar era. First of all, you've, you've caused me, as I was looking through your notes and where this discussion might be going, to get into my uh, like 80s Christian comic book collection at the top of the heap being Chuck Colson's. <laughs> Born again. Yeah. Born again. <laughs> Born again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? I mean, this is like terminology that is rolling around. All these people who've lived yeah. this life's crime. But the one that I found that reminded me the most of what you've so said so far is this one. The live it up. See, they've even got the car that you prayed on top of, right? And it's the story of this right. guy who's off doing all these things, the sex and drugs and the rock and roll, all these, this whole life. And then he becomes a Christian and none of his friends understand and none of his family understands. And he's like, hey, man, but you got to love the Lord, even if the whole world rejects you because they rejected Jesus, too. I feel like there was a whole genre of like Christian music in this era that referenced. I feel like White Cross had like 10 videos about some teenager who accepted Jesus and then his friends didn't think he was cool. Like your story resonates with a lot of people who had those kinds of conversion experiences in that era. Like they had this raw excitement that they'd found something amazing and cool, but that like nobody understood mm -hmm. it, right? Like nobody understood yeah. it. You know, uh, I relate to another part of what you, what I'm, what I was relating to Kenny is another part of what you said. And that is the feeling you had 
when you left the hood of the car and you were how everything had changed. I remember distinctly because I was I was questioning, I was thinking, I was reading apologetics. I was deep into C.S. Lewis and and Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, John Warwick Montgomery, Christianity and History. It was all these books I was reading. And I was thinking this is true. I I think this is true. And I was with my friend and his wife and one or two other people sitting on the floor in their living room when they said, we're going to pray. And they said, you know, Ken, would you want to, you, you want to join us? And I sat there with them in a little circle on the ground. And I think I, I, I uttered out loud my first prayer, which was probably something like, Lord, just thank you. And, but it, yeah. it, it was doing, it, it was taking that step. I remember right. after that, Kenny, that a, a couple a couple of people said, "Let's go to the store and uh, get something. I don't know, some whatever, you know, some something to eat." And I remember going outside and walking across the street and thinking that the entire world had changed. Right, you know, just the the trees and the sky, all of creation felt different, and I knew that I had passed from yeah. Well, say, death to life. I, I knew I had passed from one world into another. So I really relate to that. And that really is how I felt, you know, and, and, and really I can go back to that moment in my life and say that is when everything changed for me. Mm -hmm. The whole trajectory of my life traces back to that moment of opening myself up, up to God as much as I knew how to do at, at the time. Now, other things would happen later. And you even find this in scripture, you know, in the book of Acts where people will will encounter God's grace in different ways. And you'll have apostles say, well, have you, has this happened for you yet? And have you done this yeah, yet? Yeah. And and they'll say, well, I didn't know about that. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. well, let's get that taken care of for you. <clears throat> Which doesn't mean God wasn't at work in, in their life, you know, up to that moment. And I was, and, and lots of grace is happening. Lots of grace is flowing. And that was what was happening with me. But the other thing that was happening is I was kind of by myself. I wasn't going to church. Um, I was sorting things out kind of on my own and with the people that I knew. And you get what you get when when you're doing that. Um, small circle of friends, you know. Um, and, and one of the first books that was ever given to me by my karate teacher uh, was, was a book by Arthur Wallace called The Radical Christian. I don't have it anymore. I, some years ago, got rid of it uh, or left it on a shelf or something. But kind of what Matt was saying a minute ago <clears throat> about what happens to you know sort of this this faith that that catches on fire. Mm -hmm. And Wallace says at the beginning of his book, the, the radical Christian. He says, "Don't worry when people call you a radical. All they're saying is that you love Jesus more than they do." You know. And I, <laughs> as a seventeen-year-old, I was like, "Huh." Yeah. You know, on one hand, I felt like I was being persecuted all the time. And on the other hand, I comforted myself with Wallace's assurance that I loved Jesus more than everybody else who was upset with me for the way I was acting. So it's kind of like, not sure that was the best way for me to be thinking at the time. Um, but it, it, it is what it is. And I went into, you know, I went into a season which everyone around me referred to as ignorance on fire. This is the phrase that was being used by people in my life. I don't remember if my <laughs> parents came up with it or if it was my karate teacher or whatever, but everyone in my closest circle of friends um, was, was affected by what was happening to me in varying degrees. It reminds me of a quote or an idea that I that I read some years later in Oswald Chambers' devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. The sentiment is something like, we never know how much our obedience to God or our conversion to God is going to cost other people. This is sort of the sort of the <laughs> idea. Well, yeah. And I start seeing this happen, you know, around me. Like it wasn't my personal faith, you know, it was like this radical um, thing had happened in my life and it sent out ripple effects all around me, you know, like ma major cataclysmic mm -hmm. ripple effects. Some of that had to do with just God being at, at work in my life and other things had to do with me working out what that meant and how to navigate all of it and not doing it exactly right in, in big ways and small ways in my relationships with people around me. I think the other thing that affected that season of my life 
had to do with the voices that I tuned into during that season. You know, it's kind of like the imprints that happen when a baby's first born, you know, uh, the, the person that th- whose face they see, whose voice they hear, whose touch they feel, there's an mm-hmm. imprint that happens and you get tuned into those voices and they start to kind of define the way that you think and act and move through the world and where, you, where you'll allow yourself to be fed and feel comforted and all those kinds of things. The imprints that happen on my on my baby faith, my baby Christian faith at the time, were part of the reason why I was having some of the problems I was having. And I want to talk about three of those big voices here for a minute. Um, and my my early faith, the early way that I engaged with my Christian faith was primarily through conflict with other people. Uh, It wasn't kind of like, oh, isn't it great that we're all Christians and we all get along and we're in this wonderful fellowship of camaraderie. It was more like I'm alone. (laughs) There's only one or two people like me that I know and everyone else in my life doesn't like what has just happened to me. My girlfriend, my parents, um, my, you know, family members, close associates. And part of it had to do with this, these, the imprint of these voices. The first one, the first voice that I really t- tuned into, and I felt like I had to, was the late Dr. Walter Martin. In the town I grew up in, in Salt Lake City, we had an AM Christian radio station. I don't even remember the, the call letters now, but it was AM Christian radio. And every day at three or four o'clock, you would hear this little song, Da 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 da. This is the tune, and it would say the Bible Answer Man with Doctor Walter Martin, and so that became that was on every single day on this Christian radio station. When I got out of school, I would turn on the let's let's under underline that that little word there the. Underline, 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 the Bible answer man. <laughs> I mean, if there's an answer, it's the Bible answer man is going to give it to you. <clears throat> and so I would listen to his show every day. And the reason that I would is because uh, Walter Martin had written a book called The Kingdom of the Cults and all kinds of other books about uh, pseudo Christian cults, North American <laughs> Christian uh, or pseudo Christian movements that emerge, like the the Jehovah's Witnesses and and the Mormons, and because I was surrounded with Mormonism, and I had decided not to become a Mormon, I had to give an account for this, and and in fact I embraced what my karate teacher had told me that this really wasn't Christianity; it was something else. It has a similar dialect, similar terminology, but it, but at its core, it was something different. And I then I needed help. I needed ammo. I needed I needed um, something to help me talk with my Mormon friends and family members about yeah. the differences. So I would listen to Walter Martin constantly. Well, when you listen to Walter, if you ever listen to Walter Martin, it isn't just information. There's a whole way that he would engage people. Um, I think it was then I, that I learned the word pugnacious, you know, <laughs> this old archaic word. It's like a fight. It's kind of a scrapper, you know, like a verbal scrapper. And he would even talk about his interactions with people as, as you know, fighting with them and arguing with them. And, and um, when they would do something, he'd say, you swung. Like if they ask a question, he'd say, you swung once, you don't get another chance. So even his whole sense of, what was happening in his interactions was um, the metaphor for it was that you were in a, f- a fight and the way he talked was was very pugnacious. Well, I embraced that way of interacting with people when I would talk with them. Mm. I Like Walter Martin's voice was coming out of my face <laughs> a lot during that time. And it wasn't friendly a lot of times. And I like, I go back, I think I made people cry. (laughs) My own family was shocked at the way I would talk about things. And I thought, well, this is the underline, underline, (laughs) underline, the Bible answer man talks to people like this. Surely I should too. 
You guys familiar with Walter Martin? <laughs> is this ringing any oh, bells? Of course. <laughs> and Kingdom of the Cults is probably my primary way of knowing about him. Um, right. Yeah. Because, but yeah, that, that, that combative, you know, some people yeah. will look around and say, man, the internet's so toxic. All these young punk Theo bros going off on one another. You've got these, you know, neo Calvinists who've like discovered the stuff and now they're like going off on one another on the internet about like which right. of these councils is the right one, which Westminster confession you can trust and which one's like the modern modernist version. And you know, even when in the Catholic Twitter sphere, right, you've got this kind of stuff going with podcasts and people are like, what is going on with this world in 2024 where these young adult men, these teenagers and like college age guys, young adults are like tearing each other's heads off over theology. I'm like, dude, such has it ever been, <laughs> right? Right, People, exactly. There's something about being that age, kind of like discovering this treasure trove of stuff. It's like yeah. feeling like you finally have a way to like identify and point out like all the things mm -hmm. that are wrong that you've, you know, struggled with your whole life. And yeah, I think there's a real attraction in that, that a lot of young convert men especially deal with. Yeah. Well, yes That's and converting no. converting to Christianity, you know, as well. <laughs> oh, you've got it on the shelf. <laughs> yes and no. Here's my copy of the Kingdom of the Cults. Um, that that's the yes. I did own. I've owned this forever. Um, but the no is this. I was not into the cults. I've never really been into studying about uh, how to handle Mormonism and, and all that. But that's that was your background. That was where you lived. Yeah. That's what your girlfriend. Yep. So I so I fully understand it. So this is really interesting to me because I did not pursue yep. those things. But I got the book. Yeah. And so when you when you when you quote from those books, you know, and you, you, you're pushing all the buttons, all of a sudden, all these people that were, were my friends, people that were trying to help me, people that had an affinity for me, and I, just everybody in my life, all of a sudden, Kenny has become a born again Christian. He's deeply imbibing in the, um, whatever Walter Martin is serving up and I, I just would hang on every word and try to memorize every word and and then take take it out and try it out, you know, the next day at school or whatever. And it just caused an explosion of conflict around me uh, at school, at home, everywhere. All Everything in, in my life just kind of went berserk at the time. And again, it's because my faith is formed in conflict, you know, in the initial um, in the initial stages. I think to some degree, you know, the way you're formed kind of stays with you. <laughs> and so, you know, over the course of more than 30 years of being a Christian, I've had to reflect a lot about the way I interact with people about my faith um, so that I don't go backwards into that and, and learning how to, um, you know, give that reason for the hope that lies within me <laughs> with patience and gentleness and forbearance, you know. But I learned early from that voice, you know, from Walter Martin's voice. So he was informing me. The other voice that I had at the time, remember I talked about David, who he wrote his address down on the piece of paper with the Bible verses on it and handed it to me. And uh, I didn't I didn't see him in person after that, but I had his address in my Bible, the guy that shared with me on the street. And I wrote him a letter and I said, hey, I've become a Christian. And I got a package in the mail from him, a cass and I still have it. It's a cassette tape of him talking to me on this cassette tape saying, Hey, Ken, wow, you became a Christian. That's amazing. And he's encouraging me. You need to pray. You need to get yourself to a church. You need to do this. You need to do that. And inside of this package was this cassette tape from him talking and then um, re uh, recorded tapes of Christian tapes. You could record tapes onto tapes back then. I don't know if anyone still does that. But I got a, a tape called uh, Songs from the Shepherd or something like that. Keith Green, Songs from the Shepherd. And it's a Keith Green tape. It was one of the, yeah, here we go. Here we go. It was a Keith Green tape and I listened to it and I'm like, man, I really like this guy, uh, Keith Green. And I found out that he had a newsletter. He had a newsletter called the Last Days Ministries Newsletter. Um, Last Days. Now, he he had died. He had died um, by the time I became a Christian. But there was this whole ministry that was built around him. And, and you could get all these old newsletters from him and all these old articles from him. And so I started subscribing 
to Keith Green's stuff, listening to Keith Green's music. And again, now Keith Green was known during the time that he was alive as this fiery prophet. You know, he'll tell you exactly how it is. And if you're in sin, he'll tell you you're in sin. And he calls it what it is, like this black and white. And so here's another voice, right? That you fight with people and you confront people and you yell at people when you have a problem with them. And you're just doing it for the Lord because you're a prophet, you know? And I tuned into that and I discovered, I discovered that Keith Green had written um, a series of articles called The Catholic Chronicles. Now, Walter Martin, the Bible Answer Man, would often have Catholics call him, you know, on the radio program, and he would, you know, essentially say that Catholicism was this once uh, version of Christianity that had gone wayward. It was wayward Christianity. It was apostate Christianity, basically. There might be a Christian in there, but for the most part, Catholicism was in a state of apostasy. This was Martin's perspective. Yeah. Well, then yeah. I get Keith Green, and I get his Catholic Chronicles, and he says basically the same thing. I'm so sorry. Mm. He says I have to do this, but Catholics, they're wrong about everything. You know, they're, they're right about a few things like the Trinity, and they don't exactly get the Bible right, and they've got all this other stuff that they do that isn't right. And so now as a 17-year-old with zero experience with Catholicism, I have a nut, my, the second voice in my life is telling me Catholics are wrong. So he, the reason I want to bring that up is that very early in my formation, <clears throat> while I was dealing with Mormonism, I was getting this other information coming in the program about Catholicism very early. So I decided even yeah, back then, yeah. even when I was a 17 year old, I can never be Catholic. I, I have heard from two people that I really trust that Catholicism is not really Christianity. It has Christianity in it rattling around, if you can find it, but it isn't Christianity. Uh, what, Walt, what Walter Martin believes is Christianity, and what Keith Green believes is Christianity, and that's what I have to believe, wh whatever that is. And so that was my, my second um Catholic voice. Yeah, you know, the, I get to the third. Well, you know, yeah, I won't go in <laughs> deep into this. Shot but... of Keith Green songs for the shepherd. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I where even, that was my okay. very first it's, one. Go, go ahead. It's Ken. fallen <laughs> off the thing, but I still have actually the sticker that says, "If you cannot afford the retail price of this recording, please Correct. write to the below address, and we will send you information yeah. on how to get a copy for whatever price you can afford." Keith Green was like all about like, <laughs> "You want my music? I'll give it to you for right. whatever you and the Lord decide is for." Yeah. So yeah. I got Keith. Yeah. That's that song. Yeah. The uh, well. Okay, I don't want to go off on this in, in detail, but this kind of thing reminds me of the whole Sola Scriptura world and reminds me of right. the the far out, even uh, independent evangelical world. You know, right. what, creden what credentials did Keith Green have for telling everybody... <laughs> For telling everybody what the true theology is of the, you know, right? He probably, you know, by the way, right. why did he die or how did he die? Oh, the plane crash, yeah, right? Plane Something crash. like that. It was, it was in a plane crash. Yeah. So, yeah. as a matter of fact, he, you know, like, the, his wife's—he's like the uh, Buddy Holly of, of Christianity. Life. Yeah, his wife's account of his life uh, was like the number one graduation, high school graduation gift that everybody that I ever yeah. knew graduated from high school youth group, but they got a copy of. Keith Green's uh, biography written by his wife. Right. Yeah. Well, now you guys know yeah. his life, but I mean, I, what I imagine is that he just fell in with like a Calvary Chapel kind of group and he learned one way of thinking and the world's going to end any second and it's the late great planet Earth and all that kind of stuff. And he probably had no conception of the history of Christianity. And uh, right. pro probably, you tell me, is that true? Yeah, he true? fell in. He fell in interestingly with the YWAM folks. He, you know, you you can find concerts of him in Calvary Chapel churches and Vineyard churches and mm -hmm. Christian colleges and stuff. But in his biography, he's highly informed by Lauren Cunningham and the sense that we need to go out into the world and, and reach all the nations. Which, like, who can argue with that? There's so much there. There's so much grace there. But like you said, Ken, there's also this assumption that you know, that I had that I think a, a lot of evangelical Protestant Christians have, which is I, at the end of the day, 
I am going to, quote, do the research and write down everything and tell <laughs> everybody what is and what isn't true. And I have I have this really cool newsletter that I that I put it into, and that just mm -hmm. makes me an authority because I because I can play the piano and sing at concerts. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, now I look at that as a you know mm -hmm. almost fifty five year old man who's been a Christian for <laughs> thirty five years, and I think that's just crazy. Like I, you know, I there's no reason why a person should think like that, but it is the prevailing way that. Um, I, I found, and I'll unpack in a few minutes, that this was normal. This was a normal way to do it. So that's my second voice. My third voice, remember, I became a Christian because I got witnessed to on the street by a YWAM, March for Jesus missionary, who gave me gospel tracts and who you know was out there sharing Jesus. So I immediately believed that that's what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to go out on the streets and and with my Bible and my bag full of gospel tracts and share Jesus. There might be another Kenny out there, you know, walking around wondering where God is, and I just make sure I'm out there for him when he gets there. So I did I did street witnessing constantly for the first several years that I was a Christian. And and I found that at the Christian bookstore, uh, or there's a couple of different places in Salt Lake City, you could go and load up with gospel tracts. And I discovered the Chick Track Rack. Um, mm. <laughs> Jack Chick and the Chick Track. And, I, you know, I'm just looking for stuff to give people. Here, here's a track that talks about Jesus in the Bible and how to, quote, get saved and get born again and accept Jesus in your life. So I, so I found that Chick Tracts were, were helpful. Well, uh, <laughs> voice number three here now I'm reading chick tracks right and they're supposed to be telling you telling you all about Jesus and how to how to become a Christian well many of those tracts were direct frontal assaults on every other kind of religion out there including catholicism in fact in large measure catholicism is featured a lot in chick tracts and not positively so i remember opening a chick track very early on and when the Antichrist is talked about in a chick track, guess what he's wearing? Papal regalia, <laughs> you know, like the yeah. Antichrist is the Pope in in Chick's world. And the beast and the false prophet, you know, are the are the Catholic Church and the whore of Babylon. Like all of these um, images in the book of Revelation, what Chick does is he swaps them out for the Catholic Church, or he puts the Catholic Church into all those holding places in his in his uh, understanding of what's happening. And so, again, I got it at the Christian bookstore. I bought it at the Christian bookstore. So it's got to be right that the Pope is the Antichrist and the Catholic Church is the Whore of Babylon. I mean, you, it was for sale on, on, on the shelf there in the store. It must mm -hmm. be true. It was right, you know, like, like 12 feet away from the Bibles that I, that I learned all this. And so that third voice... Um, and, and and those three voices are really indicative, I would say, of the prevailing ideas, the prevailing perspective, the pre pre prevailing interactions that um, Protestant North American Protestant evangelicalism in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. These were the dance moves that 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 American Christianity was having with Catholicism at the time. And it isn't pretty. <laughs> it really isn't pretty. Kenny, um, <laughs> is this your card? Yeah, that's one card? of them. <laughs> is, let me, well, actually, is this, is this your Ch card? Chick Tracks, the death cookie. Yeah, I mean, I've seen this, them all. Uh, are any of these your cards? <laughs> I, I got them, them all. <laughs> Get them all, Matt. So uh, what's interesting yeah. is that Jack... Uh, Chick, just a little background on him. Um, one of his primary sources with this was an inside source of someone who like knew everything there was to know about the Vatican because he had been trained as a Jesuit to infiltrate the U.S. government and take it down in the name of the church. <laughs> a guy named yeah. Alberto. Uh, what was Alberto's last name? Uh, it's in here. Yeah, in yeah, I remember book, that. A detail Alberto. in the comic book, Alberto. And in case oh, you like, this stuff. is corny. Yeah, I got all this Matt, stuff. you keep that. Some... Yeah, dude. <laughs> <It's> research. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have it in a book called Reason. American Religious Subcultural Phenomena. That's what it says on the side of the box. But yeah. uh, Alberto, I mean, you, we can mm. laugh and we can poke fun, uh, but people took this very seriously. As a matter of fact, Alber- Alberto, it, it tells his story, and it starts off with Alberto as a kid watching his mom die young, screaming in terror and agony as the demons come to take her away because the salvation right. she trusted in that came through the Catholic Church was the devil in disguise. Now, uh, you and I can be like, all right, let's take two seconds and unpack this. But right. if you're Kenny Burchard, a brand new first saved Christian, and someone drops yeah, that on nothing. you. Yeah. And again, think of it. Take this concept of imprint, the, the a, a newborn that I talked about yeah, a few yeah. minutes ago, and how important oh, yeah. that is, no matter what your faith or non-faith is. When something huge happens to you, something monumental, cataclysmic, tectonic happens in your life, whatever it is, the people in proximity to you that are closest to you, that you tune Mm -hmm. into, whoever they are, for for better or for worse, imprints happen to you. And the concept there is formation, you know, in the Catholic Mm -hmm. mind. We are formed. We begin to live out of our formation, live out of uh, what is informing and forming our minds, our hearts, our motives, our, our sense of ourselves and God and the world around us or whatever. So there is imprinting going on in my life at this time. And in, you think about the source for that imprinting, right? Um the Christian radio station, okay? Like, in my mind, well, it's on the Christian radio station. Right. The, right. underline, 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 the Bible Answer Man. I mean, it's the the Bible Answer Man. Like, is there, you should talk about magisterial authority. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People want to criticize terms like Pope and Vicar. Like, how about the Bible Answer Man? <laughs> Like and then the, the wonderful Ohio State singer, University, now. right? Like and then the wonderful somebody singer went to his piano. the Ohio State University and say, "Hey, so you went to an Ohio State University?" I mean, <laughs> right. It doesn't. It doesn't hit the same. A Bible answer man just doesn't yeah, have yeah. the same marketing power. No. And then you got this guy sitting on his piano and singing the most one right. of the most popular, if not the most popular, evangelical singer at the time. Right. And see, and and your world was small. That was your world. My and world. And you didn't was know anything. Small. You didn't know anything exactly. broader than that, you know. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, so the Christian radio station is giving me the Bible answer, man. I'm getting tapes and newsletters with, you know, from record companies and print houses with logos and the names of ministry. Yeah. Like the, these are the signs and symbols of reputability, right? Um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking, oh, okay. Like everybody believes these. These must be good voices. And then third, you know, these tracts that I'm getting, they're on sale at the Christian bookstore. Um, Kenny, they, they seem, Kenny. Yeah, yeah. Kenny, they're, they're cartoons. They're cartoons. They're cartoons. Yeah, they are cartoons. <laughs> that should have given you a little bit of a, yeah. that should have given you a little bit of a wake oh. up, like, just a slight, like, you know, th- these are cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I get it. But I, so all of this, guys, so funny. is is imprinting on me and forming me and informing my sense of how to navigate, how to make my way through the world now that I have turned my life over to Jesus. And and this then, I, I go out with all this rocket fuel in me, ignorance on fire, right? This is the afterburner coming out. And what happens to me is, I now it's gonna sound like a country music song. <laughs> I lost my girlfriend. <laughs> I was fighting with my mama. <laughs> I, got, I mean, all this stuff, you know, my teachers were mad at me. It sounds like some version of a country song. But I, I even got pulled out of class, guys, because what I was, I, I made a lot of mistakes when I was in high school. I would go to the library in the high school and I would make photocopies of all of, you know, pages out of the, uh, the kingdom of the cults, pages from, mm. you know, books and tracts. And I would use school copy paper and I would then take all this stuff over across the street to the Mormon seminary and pass it out to my fellow students coming out of their seminary class. Well, 
I got pulled out of choir class one day by the principal who has all this stuff in his hand. And he's saying, Kenny, what is this? I was like, well, it's, you know, it's, it's tracts, it's stuff. Well, wh where did you, wh where did you get this? You know, I said, well, I, you know, I made, I made copies of it up in the library <laughs> upstairs. My principal in high school told me, don't you ever use your school you know, our school property, our school resources to make this kind of stuff and hand it out on campus. Again, I felt like I was being persecuted. What I was being is kind of like a dumb young man who just didn't have any direction. I didn't have people talking to me that could, could mentor me. I wasn't going to church. My friends all thought I had gone crazy. And I kind of had my, my girlfriend broke up with her. Her parents required her to break up with me because I was passing out anti-Mormon literature on the school grounds, you know, during, during school hours. And what I know now, you know, I was too ignorant and immature at the time to know it, but this is a close community of people. All these people are in the same wards and stakes and networks of churches, and they all know each other. So the principal knows the bishop and the bishop knows the vice principal. And it's like, everybody knows everybody. <laughs> so there's this anti-Mormon nut job kid at the high school dating the bishop's daughter, they got to break up, you know? So that happens to me. And my parents, you know, they, they were trying to reason with me about my behavior and why I was the way I was. And I remember saying, I just don't want you to go to hell. I told my parents that sitting in the living room. I just don't want you to go to hell. And they were so angry <laughs> that I would put it in those terms. And I'm in, you know, multiple times during the season in my life, I'm in, um, let's call them um, makeshift interventions, you know, where people in different combinations are trying to talk sense to me. And my karate teacher was one of the guys, Rick, who's one of the guys who's like, Kenny, you can't be like this with people. You're not helping. You're 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 driving people away. Um, and what ended up happening, it got so bad. Like I was saying, I want to be baptized and I want to go to church and this and that. And I was listening to the Bible Answer Man. And my mom kind of found all my sources. Like she found all the things. Like she knew I was listening to the Bible Answer Man. She knew I had these packages coming in the mail from David. She knew that I was reading, you know, stuff. So my mom removed everything from our house that had anything to do with Christianity. She, she And she was checking the mail. And later, like probably a year later, I got a box of letters from David that I had never seen before. She, she would confiscate them when they would come in the mail and not allow me to have them because she felt like they were making me crazy. Um, if I was listening to Christian music in the house, no matter what time, it, it was shut down. I wasn't allowed to either have a Bible in the house or read a Bible in the house. So no Bibles in the house. Uh, I remember my mom even coming into my room in the middle of the night and digging through the closet and finding a Bible that I had hidden in my closet. And I'm like, wow, it's got to be two o'clock in the morning. She found it. <laughs> um, and I got in trouble for, for having it in the house. And even listening to Christian radio stuff on my headphones, not allowed. It was not allowed in the house. I remember in the dead of winter that, that year, um, having to go out into my car. If I wanted to read the Bible, I had to go sit in my car, turn the car on, turn the heater on. Then I could come back into the house, but I wasn't allowed to bring it in. And I wasn't allowed to talk about anything related to my faith the whole several months after I had become a Christian because I it just had gotten so bad. Now, again, I interpreted it all through the lens of Wallace's radical Christian. All this means is that I love Jesus more than all these people. And it came to such a crescendo. It came to such a crescendo that my mom at one point, God rest her soul, my mom died two years ago. My mom got so upset with me that she became physically, <laughs> she got phys physical, you know, with me. And I bolted from the house and went to one of my friend's house, uh, George. His dad was a police officer. And I went to his house and I'm crying and I'm like, oh, I just had a fight with my mom. And and he calls the children's services counselor person who comes to his house. 
and this person sits down with me and she starts saying, are there drugs at home? Is there alcohol at home? Is there abuse? Is there this? Is there that? Are your parents married? Is there, and I, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And she's like, well, then what then? <laughs> like what accounts for this? And I say to her, <laughs> I say to her, I've been July, born again. <laughs> in, I say to her, in July, I became a Christian. And her face just kind of goes like this. In July, I became a Christian. And my parents won't let me read the Bible in the house. And they won't let me listen to Christian radio stations. And they won't let me go to church. And they oh, won't let me man. get baptized. And she's looking at me like, this is not real. This cannot be true. And she's like, really? Really? And my friend George, who is witnessing my life, you know, he knows me at this time. She's like, can this be true? <laughs> and he says, it's true. You know, what's going on? What, everything he's telling you about the dynamics of his life. And she says, are you saying all this ha is happening to you because, because you want to f follow your religion or whatever she said, and your parents don't like it? And I said, yes. And she said, I've never had a case like this. <laughs> It's usually all the other things. Are there drugs? Is there crime? You're like, why are you fighting with your parents? Because I want to get baptized and go to church, but my parents won't let me. <laughs> so let me pause there. That, that kind of a good good place well, for that, interaction. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little wild for a number of reasons, but I can tell you that like some people might be like, "Well, Kenny, you're just you're taking this out of control. You're you're going nuts." But like, yeah. Uh, you know, when a kid who's in your headspace looks to the Gospels as a source of life and sees Jesus say something mm -hmm. like, unless you hate your father and mother, you're not right. worthy of me. Like the way that that a normal person would understand that and a way that a person who's like in your like really hardcore, like radical way would understand that or like, I'm this is how it's in some ways supposed to be, right? Uh, it's supposed yes. to be this way. I'm supposed to be, the world is supposed to be against me. And I think that that's sort of built into the, into the, into the, the architecture of some of that. Uh, I mean, I experienced a fair amount of those things, uh, not always in my own uh, household, right? But like in some of the youth group activities I went to, like, it's like the world is supposed to hate you. And if the world doesn't hate you, you're not doing it right. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can identify with a lot of that, even though I guarantee you that kind of stuff never happened in my own house. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you know, my life just went a different direction. I, this is your story. It's not my story. So I don't want to go off in a detail, but this is just so interesting to me. So yeah. you weren't, you weren't even going to a church. You didn't join up with anybody. This is just you. Uh, I, it's just because, listening to your guys and just going nuts. Yeah. It's because of the way, <laughs> like, like yeah, I say, that's me. ignorance caught fire, you know, ignorance caught fire. And my parents began to try to mitigate all of that. And going mm -hmm. to church was just not going to be allowed. Like, no more gas on the fire. You mm -hmm. cannot go to church. You cannot have a... So, all of that, in reality, could have moderated me, could have, could have taught me. But they were like, no, it's just going to make you worse. It's going to make you worse because then you're going to get around all the other born agains that are out there and they're going to tell you, you that we're all crazy and they're going to reinforce, you know, your commitments and you're going to come home worse than you are. You know, Matt, I could get a little emotional during this, <laughs> what I want to tell you here, but, but, you know, you talk about reading the gospels and anyone who loves, you know, father and mother more than me, uh, less than a year after this experience of praying on the hood of my car. Easter, actually, of the next year. So 10 months later, 10 months later, two months before I graduated from high school, it's Easter time. And on TV at th that year, they were playing the miniseries, Jesus of Nazareth. This is uh, just an, a beautiful, beautiful movie miniseries. It was playing on TV during the days leading up to Easter. And we had it on in the house. My dad and I were sitting in the living room and that show came on <laughs> and, and it's the scene in the movie where Jesus character is saying, um, 
if you love father or mother more than me, you are not worthy of me. He's talking like this on the movie. My dad is watching it. I'm watching it. We are watching it informed by all hell breaking loose in my life. And my dad <laughs> sitting there next to me on the couch, he looks over at me in his kind of just his way of doing it. My dad was not an emotional guy. He just looks over at me and he says, and you want to follow this guy. A conversation I will never forget. And you want to follow this guy. And I said, at the time, in my, in my youth, I said, Dad, I want you to follow him too. And he said, well, he doesn't want us, you know, something like, he doesn't want us to love each other. He wants you to love him more than you love me. And my dad was so offended by that. Like, like, you know, I can't, that, that's a whole other discussion that I could have just to make the point that that's how it was in my life. That's what I was experiencing. And it isn't all because I was just this really godly young man who just did everything right. And everybody was against me. It was because I was ignorance on fire, you know, not that doesn't account for everything. It's a mixture of things. It's a mixture of things. And so I knew that when I graduated from high school, I had to move out like because I wanted to get back. My parents were not going to allow me to live in the house and be like I was. So I had already decided that I was going to move out of the house as soon as I graduated from high school. And I'm one of these 80s kids who was on the scene when Top Gun came out, you know, the Tom Cruise movie, Top Gun. And my friend George, I told you about whose house I was at when the counselor said, so your parents are mad because you want to be a religious guy. Well, he and I went and saw Top Gun together. And that week we went to the Navy recruiter and we joined the Navy, the delayed entry program in the Navy. Freaked out both of our parents. You mm -hmm. did what? <laughs> yeah, I saw Top Gun and I joined the Navy. Uh -huh. yeah. But <laughs> so I signed up for the Navy and that was it. I knew that when I graduated from high school, <clears throat> I was going to leave. So I signed up. The rest of my senior year, I spent doing the best I could, you know, um, in, you know, just the strange new world that I was living in, trying to be a Christian, not able to go to church. The day that I graduated from high school is the day after I turned 18. The next Sunday, I was in church. I was at the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I went there for four Sundays in a row. And then they had a home group that would meet, you know, every, you know, midweek. So I just like jumped into this church because someone said, oh, you got to go to Vineyard. You'll love it. So I went there and they started moderating me like really fast. <laughs> they, you can't act like this. Like I, I was only there for a few weeks and they were, they were like banks on a river. They were trying, trying to help me navigate my faith because I was ignorance on fire. And, um, and I said, well, I need to get baptized. And they said, okay. So it was one month after I graduated from high school and one day before I went in the Navy, I went to the Vineyard Christian Fellowship and got back baptized. Now, the day before that was the 4th of July. I believe you can look it up, 19, July 1987. I think the 4th of July was, was a Saturday or Sunday. I can't remember. I went to my parents' house having moved out. I moved out as soon as I graduated from high school. Went to my parents' house and said, I'm leaving for the Navy. Um, I'm getting baptized the day before I leave for the Navy. And I want you to come to my baptism. And they said, okay, we'll come. And then I said, and I want you to shave my head because I'm going. So my mom <laughs> shaves my head on the 4th of July. <laughs> I think it is. Someone look it up. 4th of July, I think. My mom shaves my head. I think the next day I got baptized. I don't remember if it falls on a Friday or Saturday. Uh, the 4th of July. But anyway, I get baptized with my shaved head and something happens in the waters of baptism for me. I had, um, I don't know what, what I would call it, a vision or I had a visionary experience where I went and I, and I didn't know anything, right? My, my theology was all over the map, but I was immersed in water in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy spirit forward. I was, I was, um, dunked forward, if you will, or immersed forward. 
as I went under the water, I opened my eyes, I swam away. Like that's the vision that I had in my baptism. When I went under the water, I swam into the water. I, like I, I went down into the water and swam away from myself, <laughs> if you will, and came up totally new. Um, I, a very similar experience to that night when I prayed and I opened my life up to God through prayer. A very powerful and similar, let's call it born again experience happened to me in the waters of baptism where I died with him. Like I left my old self in the watery grave of baptism and I really came up new. Something grace and power and new life came flooding into me at my baptism. Well, now as a Catholic, I understand this is the biblical understanding of new birth and born again in its fullest expression. And I experienced that a little less than one, like, like two weeks shy of one year after what happened to me the year before that July, the year before. And I joined and I, the next day, the day after my baptism, I was on an airplane <laughs> to San Diego and finished my first day of boot camp the day after I was baptized. <laughs> and that's probably where, in terms of the narrative, I should stop for this episode. And we can say, well, then what happened uh, when you joined the Navy? But we can chat a little bit here, but that's kind of my story you know, so far. Kenny, okay, Kenny Burchard, the loose cannon is the image I have now. And I'm wondering, like, like, okay, you go to a vineyard congregation. How many people were there? 25 your people. Estimate. Yeah, 25 oh, it was a very small. Oh, yeah, it was very, very small. small. 20, okay. 25 to 30 people. Okay, because I was wondering, like, what could you do in four weeks that they're already like trying to manage you and straighten you out? That, that's that, that's right. what was in my head. Like, what did you just go in there like a bull in a china closet and just start doing things and saying things? Or yeah, I fearlessly, what were you doing? I fearlessly <laughs> went in and introduced myself and said, "Hey, so and so told me I got to come to church here, and I'm leaving for the Navy, and I'm a new Christian." And I went to the home group. And that's where I got <laughs> to sit down and they're like, so tell us about yourself. And I start okay. telling them what I'm telling you and their eyes are all yeah. like, what? So <laughs> they instantly are like, okay, we got this kid for a month. <laughs> they instantly just start okay. saying, hey man, you need to shift, adjust, re retract. You know, you, you, you got to take yeah. responsibility for some. So it was because I, I really came in hot, as it were, that they felt. The, well, the I'm I, to reciprocate. Okay, I'm okay. I'm loving to hear the story, and I don't want you to tell it now, you know, and spoil it. But I'm really curious as to what's going to happen with your relationship with your parents over time and all that. So, anyway, yeah. just really great. Um, I'll throw it over to Matt if he has anything to add. The only thing I would add is that, uh, at least in terms of perception, on the spectrum of me and Jesus got our own thing going to formalized, institutionalized religion. Vineyards on the they're on the very low end of that me and Jesus spectrum. But even For they sure. knew, right, that that there had to be some sort of like authority and structuring and mentoring and plugging <laughs> into the body of Christ. Totally. And it just it's it's interesting. Like I've I've met some people who've, you know, I met a guy once who was ripping a page out of a Gideon Bible so he could use it to roll a joint, right? And he decided to read it before he smoked up and he everything like froze for him and he had like a conversion there. But even that guy had to find somebody, right? Had to find someone right. um, to help right. help him in this. And I, I, I just love that that was a piece of this story in this first year because I think it really does foreshadow and help make sense of a bunch of these other things that are going to happen, uh, that <laughs> especially, yeah. well, I don't want to spoil too much, but a bunch of other things that I already know that you've shared before about how your story <laughs> ends up going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I think you hit on it there, <clears throat> Matt. There's a magisterial mega theme here, isn't there? Like yeah. I instinctive instinctively i began tuning into voices and those voices spoke as though they had authority from god to speak and try to put themselves into platforms and circumstances that legitimated that voice of of authority and i tuned into them <clears throat> and i think that's what people do and they called themselves things like the bible answer man you know so so yeah, that's that's a big mega theme, and it'll it'll come out again, you know, as as we move on. But um, but that's a crazy first yeah. year as a Christian. 
That's pretty wild. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, how yes, old are indeed. you now? So how many episodes? We got what we're doing. One episode oh, per geez. year of Kenny. What's that? Is that the yeah, unit no. of measurement? Is that the scale? <laughs> no, we're going to skip ahead a little bit faster as things get rolling. But um, in the meantime, I, I'm I'm just riveted by this. I feel I, I, I know some pieces of this, but some of this is completely a revelation to me as you as you talk. Yeah. And I encourage people to go yep. uh, back and watch. We're only on the second part of Kenny's story, and there's a few more parts yet to come. Uh, it, it ends up with Kenny being where Ken Hensley and I are now, which is we're all in the Catholic Church, and some people might say, what in the world? We'll keep listening. Keep listening. <laughs> we're going to try and make sense of it all and explain ourselves. Uh, Kenny specifically is going to explain himself. But if you want to see uh, Ken and, and how he told his story, I told mine. We've also gone through various doctrinal topics. Those are all available through the Coming Home Network at CH Network. Dot org. Again, that's chnetwork.org. We also have an online community where people are actively walking through these questions together. Uh, you can join that for free. It's community.chnetwork.org. Again, we make all these resources free uh, because uh, we want you know anyone with questions uh, to not have any kind of inhibitions to be able to, to access these materials, and it's our partners and mission who make that possible. If you'd like to join them, you can do so at chnetwork.org slash donate. It's those monthly gifts especially that are super helpful uh, to keep these uh, programs and, and other resources going. So, Ken, Kenny, thanks for another wild, I mean, a wild ride, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Yep. Kenny's See the raging soon. bull. Kenny's the raging uh, uh, bull the now, in my mind. <laughs> Okay, we'll see you later, guys. See you, guys. See